Good evening, church family. And to all of our guests, you're our honored guest tonight. We're so glad to have you. If you were here this morning, you know we began an exciting new sermon series, Sunday morning and Sunday evenings, for the rest of this year. If we look at the most marvelous book in all of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And please listen to what I say. If you look at your Bible, you'll notice it's not revelations, as so many say. It's the revelation. The word revelation means to reveal. Of all the books in the Bible we're more afraid of, unfortunately, is the very book that says it's not a mystery, it's a revelation to reveal the mystery, to uncloak the mystery, to, to, you know, as, as a magician goes, da-da, to show the answer to the mystery. Tonight, as we begin this second part, this morning in chapter 1, we noted that the revelation is all about Jesus Christ. It's the revelation of Jesus. And this morning we saw what Jesus looks like from chapter 1 of the revelation. And those little parts we saw this morning of description were not there by accident. They're actually going to be now used in our letters the next couple of Sunday nights to be used to show how Jesus works in the churches. In chapter 1, we see Jesus. But in chapters 2 and 3, we see the Lord's church. In chapter 1, verse 20, just read for your hearing, it says that the, again, it's a symbolic book. And to show these symbols, he says, the seven stars in his right hand were, in fact, the messengers of each one of the churches. He has them in his hand. And that the golden candlesticks that he's walking amongst are actually the seven churches themselves. He's right in the middle of it. When you look at this map we have before, you can see there is a main row that linked all of these together, the Ignatian Way. And as you look at these particular cities, you see that they are in the row in which he addressed them. You have Ephesus, then a little bit north, Smyrna, and then Pergamos. You go in a little more inland, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Why seven churches, church? Because seven's a perfect number. It's a complete picture. You name any problem or any virtue of any of the congregations, they're covered within this seven church concept. When you look at these seven churches, you'll first of all have, we'll see tonight, a characteristic that I'm going to bring out about each one of the cities themselves that brings the message to light. There's also a characteristic of Jesus that's also shown in each one of them. Then you have a commendation. Each one begins, the Lord begins by showing us, when we talk to people, you want to help them, start with a commendation to commend them for what they're doing right. He does in all seven churches. And then he comes with a condemnation, what they're doing wrong. Then he has a confrontation, in some cases, with them to get them to change. And then he gives a consolation for those that do. Kind of like we parents who spank our child, and then we hug them and say, we love you, honey, it's for your own good. The consolation is for your own good. And then after the consolation comes the consideration. Consider this as you go forward. Each one of these is a precious, precious message. We begin tonight with the very first one, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Unto the angel or messenger, and we're not sure if he's talking here to one of the elders of that church. Was this letter addressed to one, the preacher of the church? Was it addressed to a leading member of the church? We don't know. I don't believe it's the physical angel. It's a symbolic book. But he's talking about somebody who's a messenger, somebody that the dress, letter would be addressed to first, who would read it to the congregation. The angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, and who walketh amidst the seven golden candlesticks. Sounds just like verse 20, the last chapter, and it is. But he's taking that scene about Jesus, and he says it applies to the church at Ephesus. Ephesus, when I say Ephesus, I think the first thing that comes to your mind is the book of Ephesians. Same church. A whole book is written to them, and the book of Ephesians 
is a book about the church, the Church of Christ. It's a beautiful book about the church. And in this text, you're going to see that these people were doing a lot of things right concerning church. Also, Ephesus was the place, was called the Queen City of Asia. It was a magnificent city. And this particular city was, like you say, in a Los Angeles or uh, a New York type of, of city, metropolitan. It also had a god, Diana, goddess of the Ephesians. In Acts 19, you remember when Paul went there, there was some merchants that were really afraid of him. One in particular said, he preaches that the God that we're supposed to worship is not made with hands. He's going to destroy a whole economy. Because they had a great temple there to Diana, goddess of the Ephesians. That was the seventh wonder of the world. You would come and see this, and these merchants would sell these idol gods you take home for souvenirs. Kind of like Myrtle Beach. You know, entertainment is our economy. And you come here and you buy a little souvenir at Eagles or at one of the stores, you know, to go home by. He said, Paul's going to ruin our whole economy. And they looked for Paul. They didn't find him. He got away. But they got to this Colosseum that seats 25,000 people. And we still have today the uh, shell of that. You can still see it today in Ephesus. But in that 25,000 seat auditorium, you might call it, or Colosseum, they shouted for two hours, Diana, goddess of the Ephesians, Diana, goddess of the Ephesians, try to convince themselves that she was their God. But in that city, Paul spent more time probably than any other place in preaching. We know for about three and a half years, he rented out a little hall, which he called the School of Tyrannus, and he taught people the Word of God. It was the Myrtle B. School of Preaching and Biblical Studies. That's what it was. It was teaching people the Bible in an in-depth way. So they would go out, and they did. For instance, to give an example, there's a man named Philemon, a whole book written to him, you remember, in the Bible. We believe he was a student at Ephesus. He went back to his home, which happened to be Colossae, and the church at Colossae met in his home. That was the church at Colossae. And when Paul wrote there, he said, I've, never, I've not been to Colossae, but I want to tell you that as Ephesians talks about the church of Christ, Colossians is about the Christ of the church. And both the church and the Christ we find in this message tonight. So it all works together now. But this marvelous city in many ways, but was destitute to know the Christ, Paul, or actually here, John, now hears the revelation I know thy works. Every one of these letters begins in their commendation section by saying this. Not that I know your flowery words. Not that I know your reputation. Not that I know your words. I know your works. The Lord knows what we really do for him. That's all that really counts. By their fruit you shall know them. I know your works. This is to the Ephesian church now. And thy labor, and that word there means working until you're weary, and your perseverance, patience or perseverance, you keep on keeping on, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. This church had a zero tolerance for immorality. They also had a zero tolerance for false teaching. Keep reading. Thou cannot bear them which are evil. Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles. 1 John 4, 1 says, try the Spirit to see they're from God. You try these people who claim to be apostles, and they were found liars. So they knew their book, chapter, and verse. Now, would you like to go to a church like that? A church that is so, you might say, loyal to the Lord in a sense of, laboring and persevering and not letting any evil in the church, not letting any immorality in the church, keeping out false teachers in the church. And you have borne, verse 3, and has perseverance for my name's sake, hath labored and hath not fainted. The Bible tells us to don't be weary, weary in well-doing, for you shall reap if you faint not. 
Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This church seems to be doing that. So you're saying, wow, what a great church. How could you have anything against it? Notice what he says in the next verse. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you. What? Because thou hast left your first love. There are two wonderful institutions, two great institutions. I would even argue the first and second most important in the whole world that God made. The first is the home. The second is the church. And since God made them, they're so much alike. And so he would use that in comparison and talking about it. When you try to get us to understand how important our relationship with the Lord is in church, he says, I'm the bridegroom and you're the bride, church. And he talks about in Revelation 19, when we get to heaven, is the wedding feast with the church and their bridegroom, the Christ. He talked about marriage. He said, wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord in your church life. And husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So he uses those interchangeably to show you the wonderful compliment they are. Now here it is. What does it mean for the church to lose its first love? These, this church on the outside was doing everything right as far as the eye could see. It looked so good. They did this, did not do that. Book, chapter, and verse. I mean, they were right down the road and everything. But it was all mechanical. And because it was mechanical, they had lost the reason for doing it. Can that happen? Let me give you an example. There can be a family. And you can say, man, look at a husband and wife and family. That's the model family. On the outside, when they're around public, I mean, they're the, 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 the one. that you say, that that's the way family should be? And then one day you hear they're having a divorce. How in the world could that happen? It happened because in that family relationship, they had turned away from the Christ. They were going through the motions like a family, but Christ wasn't there in their lives anymore. And one or both. And the church is saying, well, how did church have splits? Because some within the church had forgotten what it means to follow the Christ. Here is a telltale sign. Whenever you hear somebody say, do we have to go to church? When you say, do I have to go, you have lost your first love. If you love the Christ, you don't ask that question. Can we go to church? We get to go to church. Do I have to stay married? You've lost your first love. Look what it says here. Next verse. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. If it's a marriage situation, remember when you first saw her or saw him. And what you saw in her and saw in him. And how you wanted to be around them all you could. And you, you, your thoughts were always about them. And you write them little love notes. And you called them all the time. And text them all the time. Whatever. You were always communicating with them all the time. And you decided you want to spend the rest of your life with them. Why? We've forgotten that. That attraction. Over all the pressures and trials and tribulations of life. We forgot why we're married. What we saw in each other, what we saw in the Christ, when we vowed to be together forever. So he says here, remember from where you are fallen. You ever heard this expression? Well, we have fallen out of love. You know what the Lord says? Fall back into it. How? Keep reading. And repent an about face and do your first works. Guys, if you gave that woman candy and you opened the car door for her, you told her she's the sweetest thing and the most beautiful thing you ever saw in your life, start doing it again. Wives, you're the biggest hunk I ever saw. Man, you're my man. And there ain't no woman going to take my man. You tell him that. Go back to your dating days. Go back to redate again. Go back to your first love. Your first works. 
or else I will come unto you quickly and remove thy candlestick out of thy place. What is the candlestick? It's the church itself. We have known churches that have actually closed the door, no longer exist. What happened? How can a church go out of business? If you love the Christ, you're going to share it with others. You're going to baptize people. You're not going to go out of business. But if you begin to forget the Christ, you just go through the motions, pretty soon you just die on the vine, we say. But this thou hast, thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Ephesus, return to your first love. But I do commend you for not going against, against the grain or go with the crowd with this doctrine of the Nicolaitans. What is a doctrine of the Nicolaitans? From my best study, there's not really any definitive answer on that except they thought there was a man named Nicholas that might have come from him and he was a renegade when it comes to God's word and authority. The closest I come to it is like man like Diotrephes, or Atrophes, who we saw last time in 3 John. Diotrephes loved to have the preeminence. Somebody that wants to be somebody in the church and take a group out with him with his own way of teaching. So watch that. He said, I hate that too. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now he's talked to them, he's commended them, he's condemned them, he's confronted them. He's now consoling them. And when you come to the consolation part of each one, it's even the Holy Spirit himself. Hear what the Holy Spirit says to the churches. Here it is. The comforter. To him that overcomes. And the whole book of Revelation is about this. If you overcome with the Lord, that's the only way you can do it. But you and the Lord together, if you overcome, then you can come over and be with him. That's what he says here. To him that overcome will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. This book is so well put together. I mean, we're now in the Revelation, the last letter, and he throws us all the way back to the beginning. I told you you have to know the whole first 65 books to appreciate the Revelation letter. All the way back to Genesis chapter 3, the last time we read about the tree of life. The tree of life was in the Garden of Eden. Remember when they were driven out of the garden, the Lord put angelic beings there to guard them lest they come back and eat of that fruit and live forever. So no longer the tree of life is for us here on the earth. So where the tree of life go? It's now in heaven, Revelation 22. And so if we overcome with him in this life, we can come over and eat of that tree in the paradise of God. Isn't that good? That's the first letter. He's telling us, I'm right there in the middle of it all. I have you in the palm of my hand. I know your works. And so be real. Be real. Don't try to fake it. Be real. Number two, to the church at Smyrna. Smyrna is about 35 miles north of Ephesus. It's on a harbor. It's a harbor city. It's a smaller city than Ephesus, but it's a beautiful city. It was really loved by the Roman Caesars because it was the first place that they started Caesar worship, seeing Caesars of Rome as God. So they liked to go there, you can imagine. And also they had this ring, a beautiful ring of buildings that circled a mountain and looked like a crown, which you're going to find in a few moments. You're going to talk about this crown. They were a people that worshipped the god Bacchus, which was the god of wine. So it was a party place. It was a place where people liked to go. But this also had a wonderful congregation here. Let me show it to you. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive again. Now that's, again, another picture of Jesus we already read about. He's in the beginning. He'll be forever and ever. He's the one who actually died and rose again, never to die again. Now, why would he say that to this particular church? We're about to find out. This church, who was in a very nice place to live, kind of like in Myrtle Beach, but they were tremendously persecuted. I mean, really persecuted. Keep reading. 
I know your works. The tribulation, the word there comes from the word. They have these olive presses, these big millstones, and they would crush the olives to get the oil out of it. What he's saying is you're under great pressure. And if there's one word I hear more than any other word today, and I ask you about how your work, at work is going at work, boy, we're under a lot of pressure right now. We're all under a lot of pressure right now. They are under pressure for their very existence as Christians. Great tribulation and poverty. And it goes on to say, and the blasphemy of them that say they're Jews and are not. The Jews were the ones that led in the persecution of the church. And they were saying they were Jews, which, again, from your Old Testament background, were God's people. But they weren't God's people. They were actually persecuting God's people. And are not. And are the synagogue, which the Jews go to worship, not of God, but of Satan. I skipped one thing on purpose here. Would you want to go to a church that's constantly persecuted? You say, no, I wouldn't want to go there. You want to go to church when it's having church shootings? I want to keep you away from church for a while, right? That's Satan, folks. That's Satan. No, we're not going to stop going to church. They weren't going to stop going to church. In fact, you know in the first century, it got so bad, the church had to go underground. They still met, but they met underground. They met in secret places. They met in caves. You'll find little pictures of a fish. Ixus, Jesus. Followers of Jesus, symbols, signs to say where you could meet and where they would come together to worship Jesus. But you don't stop meeting. He goes on to say, you are rich. It's been called the poor little rich church. It was poor financially, physically, but rich spiritually. In this particular little letter here to Smyrna, there's not one condemnation, not one confrontation, not one correction, just total consolation. Listen to what it says, famous verse here now. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you might be tried. You'll have tribulation, that pressure again, ten days, a complete period of time. Be thou faithful unto death, and you shall receive the crown. Not the crown around Mount Pisgah, but the crown of life, eternal life with God. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, he says this about seven times. He's beginning to say, that's kind of redundant. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. What does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. All you parents know what it means. Son, daughter, did you hear me? Yes, Dad. What did I say? I don't know. They heard you, but didn't hear you. They have ears, but they're not listening. That's what he's saying here. You that have ears, listen to what I'm saying to you. This is what he says, the Holy Spirit to the church at Smyrna. He that overcomes shall not be hurt in the second death. Now, what is that? Let the book interpret itself. Keep your marker here and go to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. In Revelation 21, he's talking about beautiful heaven. The only, you might say, negative verse in the whole chapter is verse 8, which talks about the other place, hell. This is what he says. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the, by the way, notice the very first one there. The fearful, people who are afraid to worship God and serve God under pressure. They're linked with the rest of these unbelievers, these evil people, these immoral people. And sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in a lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. What is second death? Hell is the second death. Look at Revelation chapter 20. And look at verse 14. At the end of judgment, the death and the Hadean world, it has all the dead, 
It will be emptied. So death and the Hadean world were cast into the lake of fire. That's hell. This is the second death. Look at chapter 20 and verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Now what's the first resurrection? It's not a rapture. We, all of us tonight who are New Testament Christians have experienced the first resurrection. Romans 6 says, when we're baptized into his death, we're raised to walk in a newness of life. The first resurrection is baptism. And those who've experienced the first resurrection, of such the second death, hell, hath no power. We're not going there. Now, we can fall and go there, but we're not going there according to our intentions. Our intention is to stay with the Lord. And we're not worried about hell. We're, we're, we want to continue to walk that narrow way to heaven. But they shall be priests and of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Again, symbolic. Not a thousand, it's been over 2,000 years since Christ came. But this is the reign of Christ on the earth right now as over his church kingdom. And we're reigning with him in this millennial right now kingdom. So, going back now to our text. The church at Smyrna, get ready for suffering, because it's coming, folks. It's coming. And will we stand and be with courage, not fear, for the Lord? But the church at Pergamos, this Pergamos is now a little bit uh, inland from Smyrna, heading East. Now, Pergamum, you talk about a location, location, location. It was located between two rivers and surrounded by a mountain range. It was a natural fortress. They really thought they were really safe in the situation. The place, Pergamum, was a place that had a tremendous library. And there was a librarian in Egypt. Alexander, Egypt, the two were rivals as far as their libraries were concerned. And Pergamus tried to hire the librarian from Alexandria, Egypt, to come up and help them to become even bigger and better. So you know what the Pharaoh of Egypt did? He put his librarian in jail, so he couldn't go. And Egypt was the producer of the papyrus, the materials they would use to write. They're not saying any more papyrus to Pergamus. Well, how are you going to have a library without paper? So they develop another kind of writing material called vellum. It was animal skins. That's why you have two different types, vellum and papyrus. But Pergamus thought they were self-sufficient. They didn't need any help. They could do it on their own. And so the Lord says, let me tell you, I'm going to tell you like it really is. I'm the one with a two-edged sword tongue. Cuts both ways. Divide between the, the bone and the marrow, the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Here it is. I know your works and where you dwell, even where Satan's seat is. On one of those mountains behind the city, they had built a temple to their god, which was the Greek god Zeus. It came out from the side of the mountain, and so when they had the fires, it's like you could see the smoke even in the evening. You could see the fires in the evening and the smoke in the daytime constantly, 24-7. And it looked like a seat. So he says, it's the seat of Satan. And thou holdest fast my name. That's good. And hast not denied my faith. That's good. Even those days wherein Antipas was a faithful martyr and was slain among you where Satan dwells. There's a man we don't know any more about him except what a wonderful, godly man he was. That when they asked him if he was a Christian, he said yes. And he was martyred for the faith. And his name's in the Bible. There's another one we know from history. He lived in Smyrna. And his, he was an elder named Polycarp. And he was 86 years old when they called him out. And they respected this man, even the Romans did, and said, if you deny the Lord, we won't kill you. He says, 80 and 6 years have I served my Lord. He's never denied me. How can I deny him that bought me? And they burned him at the stake. These are the first century Christians who died for the faith, and many, many more. He goes on to say, this is where Satan dwells, Sin City, Pergamos. 
But I have a few things against you. Why? Thou hast there them amongst you. So some people in the congregation that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now what is the doctrine of Balaam? Well, you remember in the book of Numbers, there was a prophet who was for hire. And Balak, the king of Moab, saw God's people come in his way. He knew they were going to be successful because God was with them. He wanted this prophet to prophesy against God's people so that God's people would not overtake them and that God would even go against his own people get them to prophesy against them lead them into immorality and he was going to do that but his own donkey God spoke through his own donkey and said no you're not going to do that you're going to speak but God's going to speak through the words through your mouth and he did so the doctrine of Balaam is the doctrine of compromise of immorality of I'm okay you're okay go along to get along the doctrine of Balaam to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication immorality so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans which again is the doctrine of false teaching, pulling people away. They, they were doing both of those. Of which I hate. Repent. Turn your heart away from false teaching. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against you. Can you imagine? You don't want to fight against the Lord, folks. He'll always win. But I am the one that has the two-edged sword. I'll fight against you. With the sword of my mouth. Thus saith the Lord. Remember Satan and Jesus? And Christ fought him with a thus saith the Lord. He that hath ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcome, will I give to eat of a hidden manna. Who or what is the hidden manna? You know what the manna is from the Old Testament. God gave that. Who do we know said, I am the bread of life? Jesus. He's the hidden manna. And will give him a white stone. Who do we know is the rock of ages? And white is purity. Not only him, but we have also history that says that in this time, when a person won a race, they give him a white stone for victory. If somebody was in the trial and found to be innocent, they would give him a white stone. That means you're innocent. If you're a soldier, come back from battle. It was a white stone. That means you're victorious. All these come to play here. I'll give them the white stone of victory, of innocence, of overcoming. And in the stone, a new name written, which no man knows, saving he that receives it. What name do we have the church has that the world doesn't understand? Christian. I can't tell you what it means to be a Christian, really, until you become one. And you can't really tell anybody else until they become one. You just can't really explain it, but being a Christian is all so special. And then he says unto the angel, Pergamos, stand for the truth no matter what. To the church at Thyatira. Thyatira it was a city. Well, you remember Thyatira? Remember in Acts 16, there was a woman, Lydia, from the city of Thyatira? And she was selling purple dye. She was a, a salesperson. And the purple dye was to put on cloth. It was a mercantile area. They had cloth and they had these dyes and these beautiful mercantile. So they had unions, we call them today, or guilds. And your particular gill here, you make the particular cloth, this particular cloth for tents, this particular cloth for, for clothing, whatever the case might be. But these gills would have parties where they would, they would eat meat offered to idols, and they would drink and, and these idol gods. And if you weren't in a guild, you couldn't find a job. That was some of the persecution Christians were going through, because they couldn't be a part of that. So Thyatira was that kind of town. So he says, these things say the Son of God. Notice now, he's the Son of Man earlier we saw. Now he's the Son of God. He's the authority. Who hath his eyes like flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. He could see right through falseness and he refines it, makes it right. And he stands on the firm ground of a feet of fine brass. 
I know your works. Notice this now. This is one of the biggest areas of commendation you're going to find in all the seven letters. These people in this church, in this terrible town, love, service, faith, perseverance, and even the works you're doing now are greater than your first works. You're not going down. You're going up as far as works are concerned. And that's good. Notwithstanding, though, I have a few things against you because thou sufferest a woman named Jezebel. Now, her name wasn't Jezebel. It's a symbolic book. But you know who Jezebel was from the Old Testament? If you know your Old Testament, you know the new revelation. Jezebel was the queen, the wicked queen, the wife of Ahab, who had 450 Baal prophets around her table. She was teaching false doctrine. Okay? This is what happened now. There were people that were following her, which called herself a prophetess. I can teach you these things. To teach and seduce my servants. To commit fornication, to eat things, sacrifice to idols. Does that sound familiar? Look at that description right there in verse 20. And look at verse 14. It's called the doctrine of Balaam. She was teaching compromise. It's okay. I'm okay. You're okay. It, tell me your stories. Don't tell me the doctrine, the Bible. And I gave her the space to repent of her fornication, and she didn't repent. What's going to happen to her and those that follow her? Behold, I will cast her in a bed and them to commit adultery with her, spiritual adultery, unto a great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. I will even kill her children, the people that she produces through her false teaching, with death. And all the churches will know that I am he which searcheth the reins of the heart. Again, he has to look on the outside. He's the mind reader. He can read the heart of people. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Not your words, your works. But unto you, I say, and to the rest of Thyatira, as many, as many of those who weren't following this particular woman, who have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. I'm not going to ask you to do anything else because this is enough to deal with. But with which you have, be ready, hold fast, till I come. And he that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. What he's saying is, is right now she's got her way there. They're saying, you don't know what you're talking about. We're the ones who know what we're talking about. I'm going to vindicate my people. You're right. You're right. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as of vessels of potter shall they be broken into shivers, even as I received of my Father. Not only will I vindicate you, but I'm going to give you the hope of the world. Look at verse 28. And I will give him the morning star. And who do we know from our study on Sunday evening? Who's called the bright and morning star? Jesus. And the morning star is the star, the last star of the evening. It's the star just before day breaks. It's the star that tells you morning is on the horizon. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. He that hath an ear to hear, listen to what the Holy Spirit says to his churches. And so Thyatira be more holy as he is holy. What we learn tonight, he knows us, Jesus. He wants us to guard his truth. His word is truth. He wants us to grow in service. Keep on serving me, but for the right reason. Not because everybody else is doing or watching, because you love me. He wants us to live in purity. He wants us to be ready for persecution. He wants us to know that we can be lost even after we're saved. We can fall from grace. He richly rewards those that don't, that overcome. They can come over and be with him. Tonight, next, next Sunday night, we'll look at the, the next three of those churches. But tonight, you've heard enough to know the Lord knows what's going on in his churches which means he knows what's going on in each one of our individual lives. He knows if we're real or if we're fake. He knows if we're just putting on airs at church or if we really are church. 
tonight, if you're not right with God, you can come forward. We'll pray with you and for you that you might be a member of the church of Christ. It's all about Jesus. If you haven't been baptized into Christ, you can come forward tonight. We'll baptize you into Christ, have all your sins washed away, and live that Christian life by putting them on and living that life. Because the world is looking for real Christianity. So is Jesus. Will you come?